a late start, but let me introduce our second keynote speaker for the conference. Dr. Sarah Gallagher is professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Western University. Her research focuses on studying growing supermassive black holes at the center of distant galaxies and the interactions between galaxies in crowded environments. She's also the science advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency, the government body that represents Canada in the global space program, as well as the director of the Institute of Earth and Space Exploration. And she's going to talk to us about what's in a survey, simulation-induced selection effects in astronomy. Join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Gallagher. Hi, also, I'm, I'm also a member of the Robin Institute, so. <laughs> Um, so it's my pleasure to be here. Um, as I was putting this talk together, I actually had a lot of fun because I, I don't usually talk about these issues in this context. And so I'm really interested to hear what your questions are. Um, and also please, if during my talk, I use Astro Lingo, which is almost guaranteed to happen, um, please feel free to raise your hand so I can clarify. I don't want people to not know what I'm talking about. So thanks again for having me. And also I apologize for not being here yesterday. Um, as, as you may have gathered, I currently have three jobs, and so um, and they're all about half time, so that's a little bit challenging. Um, all right, so let me do my advanced slides. There we go. Okay, so um, as an astronomer, we are uh, astrophysicists are forced to reckon with the fact that we are fairly inconveniently located when we want to study the universe. So we're on a planet, um, which is exquisite and really fantastic for maintaining life, but kind of awful for many types of astrophysics because it has an atmosphere that's full of water. And, uh, and that means that when we look out into the universe, there are lots of things that are actually hard to see. Um, our planet is also located about two thirds of the way out in the disk of a spiral galaxy. This is not our spiral galaxy, but it's one like our Milky Way. And so that means that, for example, if we want to study the center of our galaxy, we have a lot of stuff that we need to look through. Um, and so that also is relatively inconvenient. So this is something that astronomers need to take into account. And uh, perhaps most, uh, there was a famous, famous example, there's something called the zone of avoidance. So if you naively just went out and you said, where are all the galaxies um, in the universe? You'd say, that's really weird. There's a strength in the middle where there's no galaxies. I wonder what's going on there. And of course, that's just because uh, it's our galaxy that gets in the way. That's actually blocking that. So if we weren't aware of where we are um, in the universe, then we might have come up with very strange theories to explain why there's a stripe in the middle where there's no other galaxies. So that's a, that's a straightforward um, explanation. Um, but I also just want to remind you that um, astronomy um, as a science is, is quite different than a lot of other sciences because to some extent we are passive observers. All we can do really is, is come up with tools and instruments and eyes on the sky and look out at the universe and, um, and, and try to interpret what it is we see. And the way that we design experiments is basically by choosing how and what it is that we actually look at. We, we can't manipulate the system. Uh, it's way too far away. Uh, and, and that's just not, not an option. Also, the time scales that we deal with in astronomy are extremely long in most cases. So millions to billions of years. And again, that's that's a really long PhD. So, um, so here's here's the kind of data we have. This image is uh, the Hubble of uh, ultra deep field the deepest image that has ever been taken of the sky. Um, all those little dots you see, basically almost every dot you see there is a galaxy. And you can see just by looking at them that they have lots of different shapes, they have lots of different colors, they have lots of different sizes. And, uh, and so that represents some of the diversity of what we look at. Now, that's what we get. We get that image, that beautiful multicolor image. But our science questions are, what is the history of star formation? These are just examples. When did rat, red galaxies stop forming stars? What happened to all the disks, the disks of spiral galaxies? Those are the kinds of science questions we have that we want to understand about the universe. And that's the kind of data we get. So going from what we can observe to what we want to know is often fairly complicated. And there are a lot of different steps along the way. And so um, when I'm 
working with new students for the first time or explaining to the public um, what astronomy is like, I say, it's kind of like CSI where you walk in and there's a crime scene and then you're trying to read to figure out what actually happened to come up with an explanation for, for the evidence that you see after the fact, after everything's already happened. So here is an example of some of the types of things that you need to worry about. What gets in the way between what we wanna know and, uh, and, and what we're able to see. So as I mentioned before, when I showed the picture of Earth, a big thing if you're observing from the ground is the atmosphere. So what this graph represents on the left is uh, you can see all of those places where we cannot observe, uh, where photons from the sky, from astronomical objects cannot reach the ground. And, um, and so every time you see a blue stripe that reaches the ground, that means light can reach the ground. And you can see there's lots of big swaths where light can't reach the ground. So that's a challenge. Um, another thing that happens is, is there, so that's, an, that's atmospheric physics, I guess, in a way. The other is operation. So it's cloudy sometimes. Um, sometimes your data gets corrupted. Uh, sometimes there's a mirror that's broken or, um, or there's ash on, on the optics or various things can happen that, that basically mean that you don't necessarily get all of the data of the quality that you were hoping. Uh, there's also aspects that just have to do have to do with the tools that you're working. So the image on the right, uh, that's an image of the Gemini Observatory, and there are choices that were made in the designing that observatory. What kind of metal are we going to put on the mirrors? What kind of uh, detectors are we going to use? How many reflections are there? How many lenses is the light going to go through? Those are the sorts of things. Those are engineering choices that are made that affect what we're able to see. And so this is just, we haven't even talked about anything um, astronomical yet, but then of course we also have astrophysical problems in terms of between what we wanna know and what we're able to observe. So the picture on the right is a fisheye view of our Milky Way. And so we have dust in our galaxy. All of those black clouds are dust and that all the good stuff is behind that dust. So if we look in optical light, visible light, the kind of light um, that reaches the ground, we, um, we can't see through dust. On the left, um, this, is a, this is a more of a subtle point. So let me just talk you through this if, if this is something that's unfamiliar. So the x-axis there, that shows observed wavelength. Um, and all of those gray shapes right there represent different filters. So if I, for example, want to look at red light, then that R filter right there that shows which wavelengths of light are allowed through um, so that I can study things in red light. And, um, and what happens when you're building up a multicolor image, so the way it works for the Hubble Space Telescope is you have a camera, you put a filter in front of it, you just let through one type of light at a time, and then you combine all of those different images and you assign a color to each one of those images and that gives you the color information about what it is you're looking at. One thing that makes this more challenging is that as we look farther away, we're looking back in time because it takes time for light to reach us on the earth. So we're looking back in time and that light also gets redshifted. It gets, sh it gets shoved to, the, to longer wavelengths because of the expansion of the universe. And so that means that as, if I'm looking at a red image and I'm looking, as I look farther away, I'm looking back in time and I'm actually looking at light that was emitted at a different wavelength. So that's also something that needs to be taken into account. Um, the, I can't just assume that the red image I see, all of the galaxies in that, in that red image, um, that, that that light is actually emitted at red wavelengths, which is around 6,000 angstroms. So this is an astrophysical thing, um, selection effect you have to think about. So I'm gonna talk more specifically about some of the known selection effects. This is one that's been known for a long time. It's called Malmquist bias. Um, and so what this represents on the y-axis, we have luminosity. On the x-axis is distance. And um, it's almost always the case in astronomy that very luminous things are really rare. And uh, fainter things are much more common. That's just for pretty much everything. That's just um, it's just the way it is. Um, and so what you can see is that red curve right there represents the detection limit um, in this particular representation. And so what you can see is that if we looked at, say we wanted to characterize the number density, so how many objects per unit of volume for different brightnesses of stars, 
if we just looked out at the sky and we just counted everything, um, then we, if we didn't take into account the fact that we can see luminous objects to much greater distances than less luminous objects, then we would overestimate the number of luminous objects that we thought they were. So this is a pretty straightforward, um, it's just a geometric effect. That's, uh, that's relatively um, straightforward, and that's called homologous bias. So that's, for example, one sort of selection effect. Um, this is an artist's impression of a galaxy survey. And so, um, and this has become uh, much more common in the, in the era of large scale surveys that covered large swaths of the sky. Um, this is a typical sort of geometry. So what this represents is, uh, you can see the galaxy that's supposed to be our Milky Way. And you can see this, uh, this I don't know what you call this shape, this sort of slice of a cone. Um, so this is the earth down here. This is us looking at a specific part of the sky. And that just represents that we're, we, we basically have a wedge, um, a three dimensional wedge that we're looking at where we're trying to see all of the galaxies in that wedge. And that's how a lot of the large scale surveys work, where what you do initially is you um, take a bunch of images and a bunch of different colors, you identify things that look interesting, and then you use a spectrograph where you take the light from each one of those galaxies and you spread it out. And, uh, and then you can learn more about those galaxies from, from the spectra. For example, what is their redshift, which allows us to tell how far away they are, whether it's forming stars or not forming stars, whether it has lots of heavy elements or just a few, those are the sorts of things you can learn from the spectrum. So this is um, what we call a wedge diagram, and this is a representation of the, some of the information that's in that survey. So what, um, what this represents is just looking at a little, a little stripe of the sky, and as you have, this is the observer right here looking out, and so this is distance right here, and then this is just position on the sky. And each one of those dots represents a galaxy. So again, naively, if you just looked at this, and these are, are, um, these are graded the color from less luminous to more luminous, and I apologize for the unfriendly um, color scale if anyone is colorblind, um, I did not generate this image. So, um, and what you can see is just by eyeball, um, there are, you can see that there are lots of more blue galaxies near that pointy part of the wedge and they're less luminous. And as you go further out, you can see that there, you can see the galaxies on average are more luminous, but that's just because we can't see the less luminous ones. It doesn't mean they're not there. We just can't see them because we have some detection limit in our images. And so we can't see the fainter ones that are far away. The other thing is if you sort of squint and you look at it, is that you might see that it looks like there's more structure at larger distances. And if you look at the closer distances where you see the blue galaxies, things aren't as clumpy. And again, that's an artifact because the more luminous galaxies are more clumped up because they tend to be in parts of the universe that are much more massive, which attract a lot more galaxies. And so the density is higher and so they are more clumpy. So if you did not take that into account, all those things go together. The luminosity goes together with um, the sort of characteristic mass of the environment. And so it's really important that you understand the selection effects of your survey. Otherwise, you might come up with a weird idea that, for example, oh, earlier in the universe, things were clumpier than they are now, which would be completely wrong. Um, but uh, but it, it could be an explanation if you don't understand your selection effects. Any questions so far? Need for clarification? Okay. All right, so here, this is a more subtle bias. And this again is a diagram of luminosity versus distance. And, um, and you can see there's a very strong curve right there that represents your detection limit. So typically with the survey, there's some brightness you're looking at. You can't see things that are fainter than that. And so as you go farther away, you're looking at brighter things, as we mentioned before with, um, with the Monquist bias. But then you also get this really sort of subtle effect um, right at the faint end where you see that purple oval. And you can see that there's some dots there that the, the detection limit is not as clean. And that is because as you look um, at the very faintest, at, right at your detection limit, there are, uh, you don't measure everything per perfectly. There's some uncertainties to every measurement. 
And, but as I mentioned before, there's a lot more faint things than there are bright things. So there are a lot of objects, many more objects right at your detection limit than things that are much brighter than that. And because of the uncertainties, you will have some objects that you really probably shouldn't have been able to detect. But because of the uncertainties, um, sometimes you are able to detect them. They get bounced right above your detection limit. And so that's why you get that kind of fuzzy edge right at the um, high luminosity, high distance end. It's just an artifact of how of the combination of having lots of very faint things and having uncertainties can lead that, that edge to be fuzzy. And so that's more of a, of a subtle uh, selection effect. So what do you do about that? Um, and this is an example of a type of solution for dealing with some of these issues of selection effects that in order to characterize them. So here's an example, and this is from um, a Western student, Konstantin Fedotov. This was from his PhD thesis. So on the left-hand side, you have an image of a galaxy. This is reversed, so we often do that because it can be easier to see structure if the bright parts look dark instead of, instead of the other way around, black background. And you can see that there are red dots there, or red triangles. Each one of those red triangles represents a star cluster that was detected at the distance of the galaxy. So in this case, we don't have to worry about Malmquist Mom, bias because all of our star clusters are at the same distance. But we do have to understand where our detection limits are um, and how, how deep we can go in detecting these star clusters. And so the figure on the right is what that, what type of analysis you would do. So in practice, what you do is you put a whole bunch of fake stars on your image. These star clusters are so far away that they look just like individual stars. You put a whole bunch of fake, fake stars on there of a range of brightnesses. And then you have a detection algorithm, you run your detection algorithm and you say, okay, how many of the stars that I put on there am I finding again? I know how many I put in my simulation, how many am I, how many am I getting back? And that's what this curve on the right represents. So because astronomer units are always really funky, on the left is bright. Those are the brightest point sources. On the right is the faintest point sources. And you can see that we find all of the bright things, which you would expect. You should detect all of your bright things. But as you go to the right, you're going fainter. You can see you have that turnover. And the fraction of objects that we know that are there that actually get detected drops. And it drops rather rapidly. And there's different curves there because it depends on how bright the background is. So in the center of the galaxy, it's really bright. And so it's much harder to find a star cluster there than it is in the outskirts of the galaxy where it's not bright. So this is the kind of. Um, this is called a completeness analysis, where you say, okay, I know that for things that are kind of in the middle there, I'm detecting about 40% of them. So if I want to describe how many objects there are, I have to do a correction for that 40% fraction that um, the 60% that I'm not detecting, but that I expect to be there. So this is an example of, of how to deal with a certain kind of, um, uh, of uh, selection effect. All right, so now, now I'm gonna, it, it gets dirty, it gets messy. So here's another wedge. Um, I showed you this before, but here instead of color coding the galaxies based on brightness, on luminosity, they're color coded based on color. And so what you can see here is that, again, if you look closer to the point on that wedge diagram, you can see there's more blue dots than red dots. And as you look farther away, there's the fraction that's red goes up significantly. So before what we saw was an effective Monquist bias that we just can't see the faint things far away, but this is a more subtle effect. And it's because luminosity and color are related. The most luminous objects in the local universe are all red. So if I'm looking at colors of galaxies, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think, that there are, that all the red galaxies are far away. And I might come up with, again, uh, naively, if I didn't understand that selection effect, I might think, oh, that means that recently there's been a whole bunch of star formation. The star formation makes galaxies blue. And that would be completely wrong because I didn't understand my selection effects. So that's, uh, so this is how it gets complicated. And it gets even more complicated because color and luminosity aren't the only things that go together, but there's other properties as well. So this is busy, so I'll take time going through here. So on the left-hand side, 
Um, what that represents is that shows you the color on the y axis, and the x axis is a label that just is a label that applies to the shape of the galaxy. So elliptical galaxies, as you can see from that graph, tend, so E stands for elliptical, tend to be red. And on the right hand side, we have spiral galaxies and irregular galaxies, and they tend to be blue. So the, the shape of the galaxy goes with the color. You can see there's a lot of scatter there. So it's not like it's a narrow, it, there's pretty, pretty fat stripe, pretty fat vertical stripes there. But in general, you're as you go from one type of galaxy to another, the color changes. Another thing that changes is the spectrum. So when we take the light from that galaxy and we spread it out, this is what a galaxy spectrum looks like. So um, those four panels on the right, um, the x-axis is wavelength for all of them, and the y-axis is flux, the amount of light that's coming out. And you can see the top two panels, just by eyeball, look really different than the bottom two panels. And the top two panels, the, the things to, to notice are, you can see that there's uh, this galaxy spectrum, there's a lot more light at longer wavelengths. So these are red. And you also see there's all these uh, dips in the spectrum here. Those are absorption lines. And down here, what you can see is that these spectra are much flatter and, and these are bluer. So there's more light at shorter wavelengths, both of these. And they also have all these spikes sticking up and those are emission lines. And these types of galaxies, so they're red and they tend to look like this. This is an elliptical galaxy. These galaxies down here are blue. They have emission lines and they tend to look more like this. And the emission lines indicate that stars are being formed, whereas the absorption lines mean that stars are not being formed. You just have old stars there. So the stellar populations, the shapes, the luminosities, the colors, the spectra, whether you have more emotion, uh, absorption lines or emission lines, all those things tend to go together. And so you have to take all of those different things into account if you really want to understand uh, how well you're cataloging the population of galaxies that's out there um, in that's out there in the universe. Um, so I'll just talk more specifically, uh, and, and I'm just I'm just piling on. Right here's another one, and that's not me, by the way, Gallagher. That's a different Gallagher. So um, <laughs> so here's two images. This is the exact same galaxy, and to see three five five one, um, uh, if anyone knows. Um, and uh, you can see that those two images look really different. So the one on the left is an ultraviolet image. The one on the right is um, a visible green image. And you can see that the structure you see in those two images is really different. And so again, when we go back to that image of the, um, think about that Hubble ultra deep field image, because we're looking at different wavelengths of light, if you want to characterize the shapes of the galaxies, we have to remember, am I looking at that galaxy um, in red light or in ultraviolet light, it depends on how far away it is. And so that's another, um, another thing that needs to be taken into account. So, um, and this is just making that point that I just made again. It's because of that red shifting, you, um, uh, so one thing that happens, for example, is you might say, I would like to look, take spectra of all the galaxies with a certain color. And the color just represents how much blue light relative to red light. And you can see that the color, um, when we have these three, spectra would be really different depending on the redshift. So this galaxy at redshift four, you can see all of the light here, most of the light is coming out in the R band um, and not very much at all coming out in the G band. This is green and this is red. Um, whereas this galaxy right here, which is the exact same galaxy spectrum, but it's at a higher redshift, there's much less light. If you looked at the comparison of the red light to the green light here, you'd say, oh, it looks pretty much the same in these two. And it's the same spectrum, it's just at a different redshift. So these are some of the subtleties of using, um, of, of doing this. And, and the reason you do this is because imaging is really, really cheap. It does not take that much time. And spectroscopy is very expensive. So you don't want to just take a spectrum of everything because it would be a waste of your resources to be on the telescope for 55 years. So, um, so that's why you have to make that decision. So here is a list of selection effects. This is for a survey called the Deep Two Survey. It was a, when it um, when it came out. It was the deepest, um, lar largest, deepest galaxy survey that had been done. 
And so you don't need to pay attention to each of these, but uh, in, independently, but you, this is a mix of astrophysical, operational, and, uh, and, and astrophysical, uh, mostly those two um, effects in terms of selection effects. And I'll just talk about one, which is the loss of objects at small separations. So the way this survey worked is that they took images, they chose which galaxies they were going to take spectra of, and then, um, and then they assigned the galaxies they were going to take spectra of um, a little window, and, and that allowed them to take a spectrum on the spectrograph. But if you had two galaxies that were really close together, you can't put the windows right next to each other. And so that means that there would be a selection effect against galaxies that were really close to another galaxy. Um, and so that's what this looks like. So, and this, and this shows two things here. So on the y-axis here, this is the fraction of all targets. So these are targets that were, that had images that then were assigned to have spectra taken of them. And this is as a function that y-axis is basically how um, congested is the neighborhood around the galaxy. And you can see that this is, I'm, I mean, I'm, this is a mess, right? So here, when they're really close together, you can actually put two galaxies in one slit. But then if they're just a little bit farther apart, you're only going to take a, your chances are you're only going to get a spectrum of one of them. And then as things get farther apart, your, your fraction goes up, but it bounces around a lot. And so it's not a smooth, easy function. You couldn't, it would be hard to come up with a, an equation that allows you to correct for a selection effect like this. And then the other thing that happens on the bottom, so that's what fraction of objects that you have images of that you would like to follow up that you actually do. And then the bottom one is of those objects that you actually follow up with spectroscopy, what fraction of them are you successfully able to get a redshift? Because some galaxies, the one that have emission lines, those big spikes, those are really easy to get redshifts for. The ones with the absorption lines are not because you have to have better spectra, higher quality spectra, in order to measure the location of those absorption lines. So this is just how, you know, just to give you a sense of all of the different things you basically have to keep track of. And so now if you say, okay, how do I figure out what my selection function is for my survey? And you think about all of the different things that you have to keep track of, that's really hard. And so in practice, what, um, what people typically do is, is basically, uh, they do a forward model of everything. So what that means is you have a model of what you think your real galaxy distribution looks like. Um, you know how many massive red galaxies are there? You know per unit volume as a function of redshift, that kind of thing. And then you take your your population of galaxies, and then you basically simulate observing it, and then you step through all of the different steps of your process for your survey, the methodology, and, and you basically keep track of, okay, of the galaxies that exist, how many of them are we actually observing in and cataloging? And, and then that allows you to understand the selection function of your entire survey and, and hopefully correct for it as well. So, um, so this is one example where the simulation actually has the potential to induce a selection effect because what if the galaxy survey the, the true galaxy population you think about is wrong. And, or, or it could be that it's degenerate, that it could be that different versions of that true population would give you the same end result. And so that's another potential, I mean, it's really hard to account for, but, um, but that's another place where, um, you know, there is some risk that, um, that, that you could have a problem with that as well. So again, any questions? Um, open to, no? Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk about a different kind of simulation bias, um, and this is related to an area that, um, that I do my research in, so this is something that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And so I'm going to talk specifically about the risk of simulation bias, and we're talking about the question of triggering quasar activity. So this is an artist's picture of a quasar. A quasar is a growing supermassive black hole in the center of a distant galaxy. So that, that stream of light represents the growing black hole. Quasars uh, can outshine the light from their host galaxies by a thousand times. 
So you have something that's relatively very tiny in the center of a distant galaxy, but it's very, very luminous compared to the galaxy that it lives in. Um, and they, uh, they're some of the most uh, extreme objects in the universe. They can be seen to very, very large distances because they are really luminous. So this is something that happens to a galaxy. So I, I often um, characterize um, the phase in a galaxy evolution as being kind of like being a teenager. So uh, it doesn't last that long, thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's very dramatic. Uh, there can be lots of fireworks. Um, and at the end, the galaxy is potentially actually quite different than, than when it started. So this is a phase in, in, galaxy, um, in galaxy evolution. And basically what it means is that you have a galaxy that might be a galaxy like our Milky Way, though again, this is not our Milky Way, it's another galaxy. We don't have pictures like this of our Milky Way. And in the very center of it, you have a supermassive black hole. Uh, so supermassive means a million to a billion times the mass of our sun. And around it, there is an accretion disk. That's a disk of gas um, that basically, as it loses energy and falls into the black hole, it gives off a tremendous amount of energy that can outshine, as I said, all of the stars in the host galaxy by a thousand times. So this, um, uh, if you have a black hole, so we saw the image um, from Yishen of M87 and, if you have a black hole in the center of the galaxy, you might think, oh, that's really easy to feed it, but it's actually not. And so M87 is actually kind of an anemic black hole, um, as is the black hole in the center of our galaxy. They're not being fed very um, energetically and they are not quasars. So you have to get gas down to the black hole. That whole system is only a few light years across. And so it's actually hard to take gas. So galaxies like the Milky Way disk galaxies have lots of gas and dust. They could easily fuel a black hole, but getting that gas down to the very tiny radii so that they're close enough to the black hole to actually turn it into a quasar and grow it is really hard. And so this is, this is a theoretical challenge. How do you get gas to the center of the galaxy? It has to go from thousands of light years to a few light years, and that requires it to shed a huge amount of angular momentum, um, and, and just getting things down to those really small radii is really challenging. So um, this is uh, it just shows that um, uh, this is just to illustrate that when we're talking about quasars, um, that's that really short phase in galaxy evolution when we think the black hole primarily grew. Um, we have to understand how the black hole in the center of our galaxy, how did it become 4 million times the mass of the sun? That's the image that was released yesterday from the Event Horizon Telescope of uh, Sagittarius A star, which is the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And, um, and I know that image looks super cool, but uh, that's a super lame black hole. <laughs> so, um, so quasars are typically much more massive, um, the quasar black holes, uh, than our black holes. You know, it's four million times. Quasars are usually like a billion, so they're bigger. Um, and also they're growing much, much more energetically. And, and the size scale of that, of that image is just, is tiny. It's the very innermost part of that artist's picture to the left of the accretion disk, which is the light from the quasar that we're actually able to see. So, um, so at some point, the black hole in the center of our galaxy likely grew um, as, a, as something like a quasar that we see on the left-hand side. And now it looks like that, which is super cool, but, um, but not, it's not a quasar. So um, in terms of the growing black hole, it's, it's not that exciting. Um, but if we look at the local universe and we look at all the black holes in the nearby galaxies that grew when the universe was much younger, um, we can basically explain the local mass density of galaxies if we look at uh, the quasar density. And so that's, um, and that's a result that came from, uh, from those two papers right there. Um, I mean, since Sultan in 1982 and you and Tremaine um, much more recently, um, that seems to be consistent. We can explain the local uh, population of black holes in the centers of galaxies, which are not currently growing and are kind of boring, like Sagittarius A star, by the um, quasar activity that we, that we can observe that happened when the universe was much younger. And so this just shows you what quasars look like. Um, this is not nearly as beautiful as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So quasars um, in images look super boring. They just are point sources. They look like stars. Um, and on the right-hand side, that shows what their spectra look like. So that's 
taking that light, spreading it out. And you can see um, that that looks really different than a galaxy. So you would not confuse a quasar with a galaxy um, in a spectrum. And, um, and so, but those are the, 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 that's what they look like observationally. So what this shows is this shows um, what, uh, how quasar, the population of quasars has changed over time. So the y-axis there on the left-hand side is, those are the very luminous quasars. On the right-hand side are the very faint quasars. And those curves represent how many, what the number density is of luminous quasars as a function, of quasars as a function of their luminosity. So you notice two things right away. So first of all, there are very few bright things. So that's pretty much always true. There are fewer bright stars, fewer bright galaxies, fewer bright um, quasars. And so as you go fainter and fainter, there's more and more objects. And then each of these curves represents a different redshift. So that means that um, as we go to higher redshift, we're looking farther away. And you can see not only were there just many more luminous quasars at higher redshift than there are now, um, but also overall, all quasars that were in existence, there were more of them um, at higher redshift. So locally, quasars, are not that common. They're extremely, extremely rare. And, and that's, but as we look farther away, we see many more because we're looking back in time when, when those black holes were really growing. And mostly in the local universe, they're not growing. So here is a plausible scenario to explain how you get. So remember our question is, how do we trigger quasar growth? Because we have that, that theoretical challenge, how do we get all that gas down to the black hole? And that's what we want to know. So, so how can we make that happen? So here's, here is a plausible scenario that explains that. If you have two spiral galaxies, so that means they have disks, they also have lots of gas, and you merge the two of them together, then the intense tidal forces of the gravitational interaction can compress the gas clouds that triggers an epic of elevated star formation. That's how you make stars. You take big clouds of gas and dust and smoosh them down. Um, and, uh, and the star formation actually progresses. It starts in the outskirts of the galaxy, but it can move inward into the galaxy. And so that, as a consequence of the gas funneling inward to the galaxy, um, merging two big disks of gas together is a good way to shift angular momentum and get that gas down to the middle. And then um, once you get that gas down to the middle, then you can, um, then you can funnel it to the supermassive black hole. And once that happens, you turn the quasar on. So this is the explanation for how you could tr trigger a quasar. And here is just an, uh, these are some simulations which show um, what galaxy mergers look like. So you have two disks that come together, and this is gonna be a snapshot of, so that's a real pair of galaxies. So that's what was trying to be explained, observed pairs of galaxies in the universe. Um, and what you can see is that uh, pretty rapidly, and when I say pretty rapidly, I mean within a couple hundred million years, um, you take two, <laughs> it's like nothing. So uh, you take two spiral disk galaxies and you smash them together and you wind up with something, a single galaxy that looks much more like an elliptical galaxy. And so you, and you can get that gas down to the center and then you can also um, plausibly fuel a quasar. So that's a good story. Um, it makes a lot of sense, hangs together, that story has been around for a long time. So here is the, um, this is a, um, a paper from 1988 by Sanders et al. And so this is uh, ultra luminous infrared galaxies and the origin of quasars. And here you can see here um, in the highlighted part of the abstract, the origin of quasars through the merger of molecular gas rich spiral galaxies can account for both the increased number of high luminosity quasars at large redshift when the universe is smaller and gas supply is less depleted, and the observed redshift cutoff of quasars, which represents the epoch after galaxy formation when the first collisions occur. So at the very highest redshift, you don't have that many quasars. It's not that the number just keeps going up and up and up. Um, and so that, that's what that, that last part means right there. So, uh, so here's the story. We can explain everything. It's galaxy mergers. That's how we, that's how we um, turn off star formation. That's how we make elliptical galaxies. That's how we build supermassive black holes. Um, it's all straightforward. And I'll talk about some of the evidence for that. So, um, so the Sanders et al. paper was specifically about following up 
the most luminous galaxies that were detected by this, te uh, this telescope, the infrared astronomical satellite, um, and uh, which was flown in 1983. Uh, it was one of the, it was the first um, far infrared survey of the entire sky. Um, it took really lousy pictures. I mean, it was awesome for 1983, but did not take beautiful pictures. And so the things that it detected were very, very bright. The things that were detected by this satellite cannot even be followed up, couldn't even be followed up by the next generations of infrared telescopes because they were too bright. So, um, and, and so if you look at something that only detects the very brightest things and your brain should be going, well, quest bias. Um, and, um, and, and, and these objects, uh, the sample that was followed up by Sanders et al were the most luminous 3% of what was an extremely infrared bright sample. Um, and, uh, and then the space density of those objects matches the space density of quasars in, within, the same, within, within the same distance. So I have a, a warning here, which is, which is hidden by this, so I'll move this up. Um, uh, possible selection effects. So you should be going ding, ding, ding. a little concerned about this. So um, basically just because this uh, satellite is only looking at the very brightest things. Um, but there was other evidence that those objects were merger remnants. So this, these are ground-based images. And again, these have been reversed. So the black is actually where the stars are. Um, these are ground-based images of merger remnant of the, of the sorry, of the, the, the objects that were identified by Sanders et al. Um, those really infrared bright uh, galaxies. And then there were ground-based images to follow those up. And these look like merger remnants. So they don't have nice organized spirals. They don't look like nice smooth ellipticals. They look kind of like train wrecks. And that's typically what merger remnants look like. So that fits together with uh, the Sanders et al. hypothesis. Um, and then if you take those objects, and so those were images from the ground, um, and then you look at them with the Hubble Space Telescope, where you don't have the smearing effect of the atmosphere, so you can get much crisper images. And they still look like merger remnants. And this uh, inset right here just shows you part of the challenge of doing this kind of work. So this is the quasar. You can see these spikes right here. Um, that's, so the quasar and then really in the center is by far much, much, much brighter than the galaxy that's around it. So studying these galaxies is really hard uh, because you have to be able to subtract out the light from the quasar, uh, which is much easier to do from space than it is from the ground. And uh, and the light there just really dominates. And then, so these, this is the same image they've just played with uh, the stretch so that you can see the fainter structure here. Um, and uh, it still has the same thing in the middle, but they've just, uh, they've just changed the contrast. So you can see the fainter structure. And again, I mean, these look like, uh, these look like merger remnants. And you can see this is the phone number of the galaxy they're looking at. So it was discovered. No, that's really what we call them. So uh, it was discovered by uh, by IRS. That's why it has that. Um, all right. So here is a more, much more recent paper. This is a theoretical paper I mentioned before, and I just have highlighted this here. So this is um, when we have supermassive black holes in the hierarchical universe, a general framework and observational test, and you can see what I've underlined there. In the abstract, is, uh, it says the general idea that quasar activity is triggered in major mergers. So this is sort of the canonical understanding of this is how we, how we uh, trigger quasar activity. And if you actually go um, and look at, uh, and so this is a couple years earlier, this, so this is uh, Di Matteo et al. This was um, a series of simulations of merging galaxies. And this is in the early universe. And you can see this is a time sequence. So you have the two spiral galaxies coming together. And then what happens is they're, they're really far apart. They get closer together. And then they bounce back and forth, um, at, you know, losing energy with each passage until they eventually come together and form a single galaxy. So, and this is just the, this is a picture from the simulations that show um, that basically as you go, you, it, it tracks the gas and sees how the gas gets funneled into the black hole and if you can turn on the quasar and basically they were able with their simulations to do that. Um, but I just wanna highlight that in the simulations themselves, remember I told you how small the black hole is compared to the galaxy. 
So the black hole is a couple light years across. The galaxy is 100,000 light years across. And simulations that need to have high time resolution, for example, if you're following gas that's forming stars, that's feeding a black hole, you need to have lots and lots of time steps, and you're dealing with things that are really small, they're basically not resolving in the simulation what's happening right around the quasar. So the way it works is that the gas gets to a certain point in the galaxy, and essentially the computer simulation goes poof, it goes onto the black hole. Um, I mean, they use equations, and so, um, but, uh, but they're not actually simulating it. Um, so, uh, but th this works basically. So they can tune, they can tune their simulations and they can account for the growth, you know, turning on of quasars through mergers. The, the merger rate is determined by some of the cosmological simulations because they have a whole bunch of galaxies and you see which galaxies get close enough together to actually merge. So, um, so now I want to say, but this is the but part of the talk. So, um, if we look at um, if we look in the local universe um, and we look at merging galaxies, that's a really famous example called the Antenna. And um, on the left is the large large view, and on the right is the smaller view from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, major mergers are are most common in the field, uh, which are low density environments. And that's because in environments like galaxy clusters, which we have on the right, now you might think, wow, there's a lot of galaxies there. I bet they merge all the time. But they don't because those galaxies are zooming past each other at a thousand kilometers per second. And they're also in a huge, um, massive environment where there's lots of other galaxies. So galaxies will zoom past each other relatively frequently, so density is really high, but actually merging is really uncommon because they're moving too fast. And also you can see from that picture on the right, those galaxies all look red. And red galaxies, remember, they've got old stars, they don't have gas. So even if you had a galaxy that, even if you had galaxies that merged in that kind of an environment, it'd be pretty hard for them to fuel a quasar because they don't have that big reservoir of gas. So, um, so that's, uh, so, so it's maybe a little non-intuitive that that's what happens, but, but in the local universe, mergers are most, the gas-rich mergers are most common in the field because first of all, those galaxies actually, they're the only two things that are gonna attract each other, so they're able to merge. And they also, in the field is where galaxies still have a lot of gas because in denser environments, they used up that gas and form stars. So, um, but if we look at, farther away, so we're, remember the quasar epoch was when the universe was about a quarter to a half of its present age. So, um, so that's what we need to think about. What were galaxies like then? And in this work, um, which was by, um, uh, by Coyle et al, so that's not their, their figure, but I just, want you to, I just want to remind you of this. So one of the things that people who, uh, who want to characterize how clumpy things are, they do what's called a clustering analysis. And they basically look at how close together are different galaxies. So Coyle et al did an analysis and they said, well, at redshift one, remember that's near the peak of the quasar epoch, um, quasars cluster, they don't cluster, they cluster like blue star forming galaxies. And, um, and so what that means, where most of those are, that means that quasar host galaxies are found in groups. So that means you have a handful of galaxies together, they're not in the field. So, so this isn't the same as what we see in, in the local, local universe. And then I just wanna show you, this is an example of a galaxy group. Um, on the left is, um, is a visible light image. You can see there's three main galaxies in the group. And if you looked at that, you'd be like, those galaxies are just hanging out, they're minding their own business. But then if we take an, if you look at an image in radio light, and that's, that shows us where the cold gas is, it looks like that, which is really quite dramatic, right? It makes it quite clear, oh, those galaxies know about each other. They've been interacting. You can see those are called tidal tails, those sweeps. And so that means they've been moving around each other, pulling the gas out. They're clearly interacting, even though it doesn't really know, it really doesn't look like there's that much going on. And you can see that there's evidence for significant interactions between those galaxies, but not mergers. So those galaxies do not look like they're merging. And maybe at some point they will, but right now they're, they're certainly not in the midst of doing that. 
And then here's another example um, of three galaxies. And these galaxies, so those green contours represent the gas, the, the cold gas in those galaxies. And these are three galaxies that, again, if you look at those galaxies, they do not look like they're merging. They look well organized. They have nice disks. Um, but there is much less gas in that group than you would expect. So um, if you look, if you look at a spiral galaxy, you expect some fraction of it should, should some fraction of the mass should be made out of gas, and that has much less than it's supposed to. So um, what's likely happened is that this, these three galaxies have actually been interacting for quite a while, uh, but they haven't merged, but they're clearly affecting each other. And so this is another example where you have a group of galaxies, they're clearly interacting. The gas has been consumed, which probably means it was converted into stars at some point, um, very efficiently, more efficiently than a galaxy that's hanging out all by itself, but there is not a merge, there, there are not merger, evidence for merger remnants right here. So here is our evidence for the story I told you that merger remnants are uh, the two gas-rich galaxies interact, uh, merging together form a quasar. We've got the simulations that are fantastic. Uh, they're beautiful. They, they tell a really nice story. The quasar demographics tell us, okay, we know quasar activity was triggered uh, more frequently at early redshift. The universe was smaller. Galaxies were closer together. Um, you expect more interactions to happen. And then we can look at it the evidence of the host galaxies, which also clearly look um, like merger remnants. But I just want to say that there's selection effects associated with all of these lines of evidence. So on the right-hand side, that's a, that is a galaxy that's nearby. And so saying, oh, this is just what happens at the, you know, we can look at a local analog and that'll tell us what happened farther away. We have to remember galaxies are not the same now as they were when the universe was younger. Um, the middle one is, yeah, that one's fine. But the one on the left, the simulations. So um, if you take two gas-rich galaxies and you run a simulation, you merge them together, you can funnel a lot of gas down to the center of the black hole. I am not disputing that. But it could also be the case that maybe you have a group of galaxies and they will interact. And with those interactions, you can actually drive gas to the center of the black hole without merging. And so why is that not being simulated? It's because it's really hard. So it's already hard to merge two galaxies and to follow that simulation end to end. It's computationally very expensive. You have to figure out how the galaxies are oriented relative to each other before you smash them together. Um, and so, and you don't wanna waste your time. You don't wanna do a simulation that's not gonna tell you anything useful. Um, so it makes sense that they're doing that, but. But to some extent, there's this, this narrowing of the possibility space because doing more complicated simulations, which are also a plausible explanation for how you trigger a quasar, is really hard um, and computationally much more expensive. And if you have three galaxies and you want to set them up with initial conditions, and I mean, where do you start? And, and how do you make sure that your simulation is actually useful? So that's a different kind of selection effect that I just wanted to highlight because it's a little more subtle, but it can really narrow the scope of possibilities that you consider. And, and also in astronomy, you design your experiment to answer your questions and you can, and you can think about not, um, if, you're, if your expectations of what likely stories are is, is too narrow, you may, not act, you may not look in the ways that will actually allow you to, to come up with the answer. So I, um, I think, yeah, we're, we're coming up to the, to the end. So this is just, a, again, to make that point about just reminding you that um, galaxies uh, in the early universe had more gas. Um, and this is the, um, yeah, so this is just sort of the claim is that while a, ma a merger between gas-rich galaxies is clearly sufficient to trigger starbursts and power a quasar, it's probably not necessary at high redshift where most quasars are found. The galaxies are more gas-rich. Um, and, uh, and, and it's probably not required. And the ubiquity of merging pairs as the drivers for triggering starbursts and fueling quasars is driven by both observational biases, which are driven by what we can observe locally, as well as these computational biases that I mentioned before of just what's sort of plausible to actually simulate. 
So I'll just leave this up as a summary slide. And um, I thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. All right, questions for Dr. Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, this was so clear and straightforward that I understood. So um, thank you, it was great. Although I didn't like understood it a lot because I don't know anything about this stuff, but I have a few questions, but I'll stick to like maybe two. So one of the things you're talking about was the astrophysical properties that get in the way. And I'm just wondering, even though they get in the way, do they not tell you something about the environment or like what's going on? Like, are they not at any point necessary? Uh, yes, yeah, so certainly they are really important to understand, and often um, it's the uh, it's the case that they'll cause a problem, which will, will make you sort of investigate further. So in that case, they're useful. Um, the um, I think the joke for a lot of scientists is is that the first thing um, you know when when you first think you've discovered something, you're convinced that you just messed up your analysis. Um, and so, so I think that's, that is a big part of it. Absolutely, I mean, we have to understand these things in order to, um, they, they do tell us something about the universe. The fact that, you know, young stars are born in really dusty clouds, so they're really hard to see. I mean, that's a part of what's astrophysically important. Those are the kinds of environments that are required to form young stars. So absolutely, they are, um, they are relevant. But if I want to study, for example, other galaxies, I don't really care what's happening in the Milky Way. It's just in the way. Um, but, uh, but certainly, if you want to understand our galaxy, then yes, all of those things absolutely are important. Right. OK. OK. And so I'll, I'll stick to two more questions. So the other thing I want to ask you, uh, I kind of a little bit got lost when you were talking about the, am I pronouncing it right, the Malquist bias? Malquist, yeah. Malquist. Um, Were you talking about it as a singular thing? Because it seems like there's like more than one type of bias going on there. Like, are there different types of? So that? the Malquist bias is specifically just the geometric effect that brighter things you can see to greater distances. So if you, if you want to understand what fraction of objects, for example, are luminous, then you need to take into account the fact that, uh, so say I see, um, you need to take into account the fact that you can see them to much greater distances. Um, and so often what people will do to correct for Malmquist violet bias is they'll do what's called a volume limited sample. So they'll say, I'm only looking out to this distance and my survey is sensitive enough that I can detect everything out to this distance and I'm not going past it. So that's one way of, of counteracting all this bias. Okay, and then my next question, very like novice question, but, and I know what your research is and stuff, but I'm, yeah, very like straightforward question, but because you are looking back in time, and I know you are studying the evolution of galaxies, but what does what does looking back in time tell you exactly about the future? What what are you trying to look at when you're probing the past? Like, how helpful is it? This is, I guess, um, so um, let's see. I'm just trying trying to think of how to how to respond in a how does it tell? So if we understand, so so one of the questions, for example, is we want to understand like what cosmology governs our universe. And so the only way we can access that is by looking back in time. And if we understand what the geometry of the universe is, then we can make reasonable predictions for how it's going to evolve forward. So that's, um, that's the type of question where learning what's happened, you know, assuming physics is right, um, <laughs> and I'm sure you all have strong opinions about that. So um, then, uh, then that can help us figure out how things are gonna evolve forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Eric. <laughs> well, thanks for this talk, Sarah. Uh, first, uh, a comment and then a question. Okay. So I like the fact that you brought uh, like two types of distortion. One coming from the stuff we observe. So you want to observe an object and there's all kind of distortion and 
the tools we're using and in the environment. But then there's also the distortion in, in the models that was mostly the topic of the conference. So I like the fact that you bridge both. So those. My question is much more uh, uh, empirical, maybe. So you, you talk about gas, right? So those those quasar form when there's enough gas to move like that. Um, what's in those gas? And does it make any difference? Like, are those galaxies formed basically of the same kind of gas? And could it make a difference if some galaxies are made of certain gas, whether they emerge better or not? So, uh, yeah, so that is a, that is a good, good question. We call that gastrophysics. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in some sense, it's gas, in some sense, no. So the accretion disk itself, which is actually cooling the black hole, it doesn't really matter what that gas is made of. So, um, but as you, um, there are certain ways that the composition of the gas matters. So for example, in the early universe, um, the gas had many fewer, had a lot fewer heavy elements. So that means it has a lot less dust in it because dust is made out of silicon and there's carbonation dust and, and silicon dust. And uh, so there's a lot less of that. And, uh, and astronomers call anything heavier than lithium a metal because um, we don't care about chemistry. Um, so that, um, so what we say is they're, they're heavier metals. And those, um, when you have more metals, so that's like iron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all of the, anything heavier than, than lithium, as well as dust, it means the gas is able to cool much more efficiently. So if you, in the very, very early universe, you only have hydrogen and helium, and it's much, much harder to cool that gas, which means that it's harder to collapse it gravitationally and, and form stars. So that, uh, so that matters um, in terms of how efficiently you can form stars, what kinds of stars you form. It matters much less for cooling the black hole. And it actually turns out that if we look at quasars um, across a range of redshifts, they all seem to have very similar um, fraction of metals in them. Um, even at larger redshifts. So just observationally, it doesn't seem like it's that different, but it definitely matters um, in terms of forming stars. So when you're merging two galaxies together, if they have a lot less heavy elements, um, then they'll form stars in a different way than galaxies that have many more heavy elements. So that's another effect of you know, looking at a local universe compared to the hydrogen universe. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, a lot of it somewhat over my head, but I'm, I'm trying to learn these things. Um, I'm curious, when you mentioned in the beginning about this, uh, this like bar that's like blank, we can't see through our own galaxy, right? Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but is there, is there any way of, of filling in this gap, like maybe indirectly? Like, can we get around? Uh, this blind spot somehow. I'm just curious if you could say more about this. Yes, so yes, we you. can get we can get around this blind spot, which Good. is very fortunate. Um, but we just can't get around it by using optical light, the kind of light that we can see with our eyes and with uh, you know common cameras. So if you take a picture of our galaxy in infrared light, the infrared light can pass right through the dust. Uh, well, and sometimes the dust actually will glow in infrared light. So you can use different wavelengths of light in order to where the dust is transparent, and that allows you to look through the galaxy and to see other things. So that's one of the one of the sort of tricks of the trade. But you can imagine thinking historically about astronomy. I mean, originally people were using their eyes, um, and then they had cameras, but still they were sensitive to light that's pretty similar to what our eyes are sensitive to. Um, and and then some wavelengths of light you can't even observe from the ground. You have to go up into space. So every time there was a new regime of, of light that was opened up, um, then, uh, then we were able to get a much clearer view of our galaxy. But x-rays also can penetrate, um, can penetrate through the gas and dust. So the x-ray picture of our galaxy, you can see basically all the way through. So, uh, I mean, in the same way that it's actually the case that the, the number of atoms between us um, and the center of our galaxy is about the same as in your hand. So, so think about it. an X-ray can penetrate that, right? So, so wavelengths of light that can go through your hand uh, allow us to see the center of the galaxy. Fascinating. Yes. Yeah.
Thank you so much. It's going to be a very naive question, so I, I hope it's not the last. Um, it, so here you're talking about the stimulation that is about merging, right, the, the galaxies. And, and so it, when you were explaining the process, I, I understood that they, they take time, they kind of go closer to each other, and then they lose gas, and then they go and then they, they separate again and they come yes. back and they separate and um, and it takes a long time when well, you said short but it sounded long <laughs> and then so but then you showed this like three ones that seem to you said not um, they seem to it, interact in mm -hmm. a way but not being merging right? yes and I would like to maybe know why or how do you know that they're not merging? If like you, it's an observation at a certain time. Right, right, yes. But um, so I'll just show you the, yeah, so I'll, sh I'll show you the image. Okay, so, yeah, so could they be at a stage where they are separate but in the merging process? So, um, so we're, let's see, I'm trying to think of a, no, no, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, so the answer is eventually these galaxies may merge, sure. But when you have two galaxies that are, if you have two galaxies that are an isolated pair of galaxies and they come together, um, what happens is those two galaxies are the two mass, two most massive things around. So they're going to be attracted to each other gravitationally. And when they do the, the first pass, in that first pass, already what happens is you get, they're called tidal tails, so you get these streamers that are pulled out. And so if you take an image like the image on the right here, which is the radio image, you would see, um, you would already see the effects, even on the first passage. It usually takes a few passages, depending on the relative velocities of the two galaxies to each other, for them actually to come together and start merging towards the end, it goes much faster, but it depends on those initial conditions. So you can imagine if you had two galaxies going like this, you know, maybe eventually they would come together, but it might take a really long time. Whereas if they're right at each other, it would happen much more rapidly. So what happens is when you have more than two galaxies, each one of those galaxies is a source of mass. And so it can just it can just take much, much longer for them to actually come together because you know, think about the motion. And, and of course, it's really hard for us to know what the motions are in the plane of the sky because we just have this snapshot. When we have something like the image on the right, we can say, okay, I think clearly they swung past each other again. So that tells us something about the motions along, you know, perpendicular to what we can see. Um, but because there's more than one sort of center of mass in this system, it just takes a lot longer and it's more complicated and they may never merge. So, and it, and it could just take a long time. So did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, also I want to reiterate a very well done talk, easy to follow if one doesn't know any astronomy um, or cosmology. So I had a question that's um, just a little bit more general about data, data processing and evidence. And so the first half of the talk, you talked a lot about different, different, way, different biases and the ways that you go about correcting them using models and simulations. So philosophers of science have recently gotten really interested in this data processing in order to get a data set that's actually more, um, a more accurate, more reliable data set from which we can make inferences about phenomena. And I take it that's what you were describing in the first half, all these ways we have to correct the data we get from our instrument in order to make inferences about phenomena. And so I, my first question was, do people make epistemic distinctions about uh, how close the, the data is, like how unprocessed it is? So is there a sense, like if we think of a very naive empiricism, we might think that the more direct data is gonna be better and more processed. So is there any, any epistemic distinction, like the weighting of the evidence based on the processing, or is it just based on the particular, say the particular technique, the particular model, like you might all agree that this one's a more reliable way of correcting for this mistake than another, this particular right. bias? Uh, so the answer is yes. And um, and I, I would say it's, it's a matter of, I don't know, of 
philosophical preference, I would say, to some extent. So, um, and there are, to some extent, there are purists, right? Who want to start with the kind of rawest data possible and see if they can extract what it, what it means. So I'll give you um, a, a relatively straightforward example. So if you're taking, say I want to look at a field of stars and I, in order to um, build up an image to see the really faint stars, without totally saturating the really bright stars. So if you if you just open your camera and you look at a, a group of stars and you just leave your camera open for a while, that'll allow you to see the faint stars, but the bright stars will basically get burned in and then you can't actually measure the light. And they'll spread their light all over the place and they'll contaminate the image. So one of the strategies then is to just take lots of really short images and then combine them. So, and if you, uh, if you do that, in order to combine them, often you have to align them, and maybe if you're taking them from the ground, like the weather changes a little bit, and so there are different, each image might be just a little bit different. So a purist might say, I'm just going to look at each one of those individual images, and I'm going to collect all that information and characterize my data. But the problem with that is that the uncertainties in each individual image are much higher than in the combined image. And so I, uh, people do both strategies and it depends on which kind, of, what your science goal is basically. So is it really important that I detect the faintest things? Then I'm not gonna worry about characterizing, you know, looking at each individual image, I'm just gonna combine them all together and look for the faintest things. If instead your question, your, what you say is, I'm gonna look at things that are sort of for example, if you were looking at um, a transiting planet and it's really important that you measure very accurately the amount of light in a short period of time, then I might say, I'm, I need to analyze each one of those individual images. So it really depends on what your science goal is in terms of what your approach is. And in some cases, it's just impossible to get information out of the really raw data. It has to be highly processed before, because sometimes the signal is just so faint. And it's not until you're able to, for example, add together a whole bunch of images that you have enough information to actually extract your science case. But, but people take both approaches and it really just depends on the science school. Okay, thanks. And just like, so one follow-up question. Yeah. In light of all this processing that happens, it seems like you, probably even in that first case where they're just looking at individual slices, mm -hmm. there's still processing happening. It, it's not uh, like, it's not yeah, right, right. the biases are being corrected out and all these. Yeah. So I guess then the second was in the second half of the talk, you talked about the difference. Um, you know, you put the, uh, the evidence for mergers on the board mm -hmm. and had three different uh, three different types of evidence, and so and one of them was simulation. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how how well does simulation, observation, computation, or do they still stay? You know, can we still separate them? Are they still meaningful distinctions? Um, in light of all the processing that happens, even of our raw, right, right. even of the observations. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. So um, I would say I think that the simulations and the observations are really uh, becoming closer and closer because in a lot, a lot of the some of the modern uh, projects that you can't even interpret the data without without using simulations, either because the signal is so faint that it's really, really hard. You couldn't extract it without the machinery of, I mean, to some extent, if you think about um, maybe one of the most strike, striking examples is the gravitational wave detections. So in that case, you have to have a library of simulations in order to look for that signal because it's so faint. And then you have to try to pull that signal out. And so saying what's observation and what's simulation, I think, it, 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 it is, it's really hard to, hard to tell at that point because they are so interleaved. And, um, but it also means that you really have to have a, a good handle on where your selection effects are, both the instrumental observational astrophysical and then, and then the simulation um, selection effects because they just can have these really complicated interactions. Does he still have a question? Yeah. Bill, do you want to ask a question? Uh, thanks. This was terrific. Uh, I'm now, this is a, I, I don't, you were talking about 
the costs of doing the simulations. And it struck me as uh, one, there was a, uh, at a, anyway, at some meetings a, a while ago, one of the things that came up were ring galaxies, where one galaxy goes right through another one and where you can't follow the uh, the uh, one that went through and the uh, uh, so that what what you see afterwards is is just the ring from the galaxy that was penetrated by the other one and that it was suggested that this would be a, a good uh, good ways of getting at maybe uh, sources of information about dark matter. But what I was wondering was how hard would it be to do a simulation of, <clears throat> of, of a version of that and sort of the two ways where, where one goes through and you still see it and, and where you, and, and I don't know, uh, but it just struck me as one thing that you might know something about that <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so the ring galaxies are um, the, I mean, people have done lots of simulations of those, and that's part of the justification for thinking, oh, maybe this is, um, if you had a galaxy that only had dark matter and didn't have any stars, and it collided with the galaxy, you could see the, um, you could find evidence for it in the ring, even if you can't see the galaxy itself. And I think in that particular case, the most famous ring galaxy is called the cartwheel. And when you look at the cartwheel, you can see the galaxy that went right through the middle of it. So, um, so, that, so in that case, that's a really good justification to run a simulation because you see something that looks pretty, uh, pretty compelling. And when the simulations were run, and they definitely have been, I've seen lots of them, um, you, you get that really striking ring structure. So uh, I think, and I imagine also, if you think about um, um, simulations are used often when you're writing an observing proposal because you're asking for very expensive telescope time. And so if you have a simulation that says, hey, this is, uh, I've simulated this system and here's the data that I might see. And if, uh, and if I see what I'm expecting, um, I'll clearly be able to detect it and, and come to this conclusion. So there, that's another way in which simulations are often used um, it hand in hand with observations is as a justification for asking for telescope time. And so that's the, that's an example where, where that would be a really good use of it. Thanks. That's great. Okay. We still have some time for questions. Yes. Okay. I'm scared. But I'll <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to say back to you when I said to be one of your main conclusions and, and for you to tell me if that's, if I'm on the right track in interpreting it this way. So um, you walked us through a variety of observational and um, simulational um, uh, selection effects, right? That's going to, to push things in a certain direction. And I take it that the conclusion about this sort of galaxy colliding model of quasar formation, if I have it right, um, that the conclusion is something like, um, hold on a minute, we can't conclude that quasars form from galaxy collisions, but rather you've given us a sort of extreme form of galaxy interaction that, that and shown that this is a way to, to lead to quasar formation. And so you've sort of, um, uh, what this has shown is that there's sort of an extreme endpoint of interaction uh, that does suffice for this. And then what's unknown is sort of what the uh, type and extent of relevant similarities to that extreme, um, form of interaction uh, are that are required for this type of formation. Yes, but there's a there's a, a, a an additional point too that I that I did not mention about sort of the further motivation for that kind of a picture. Um, and so let me go to the, the bigger version of this. There we go. Um, so yes, so I'm saying um, I think it's true. If you take two gas-rich galaxies and you slam them together, then you are pretty likely to get a to get to feed a black hole. That seems like a completely plausible thing. And then the question is, is that the only way you can make it happen? And part of the motivation for saying yes, we require a merger to make a quasar is because that merger does other work too. 
So that merger also may allow us to form an elliptical galaxy. We need to understand where did elliptical galaxies come from? They don't form, they don't form, if you have a giant cloud of gas and it collapses to form a galaxy, you get a disk. You don't get an elliptical galaxy. So we have to understand how can we form elliptical galaxies? And this might, might be able to, because your disk is primarily rotational, it's moving around like this. Um, uh, elliptical galaxies have random motions for all of their stars. So you have to mess up the orbits of all the stars in order to get an elliptical galaxy. And taking two disks and slamming them together will probably do the job. So that's another reason why this is so appealing is that it's sort of one process that does a lot of work. So it fuels the quasar, it builds up elliptical galaxies, it uses up all the gas, it builds the stars, and that is very appealing. If you have, you know, 15 different processes and sometimes one of them does this and the other does this, that's just a lot more complicated. So, uh, so that's another reason why that particular scenario is really appealing. <laughs> okay, um, so I, one thing I'm struck by was that the community would be quite convinced by um, those early simulations, given that we're talking about the number of like particles in the probably a hydrodynamical simulation. So yes, yeah, so the earliest simulations were all n body, so that oh, means okay. they're kind of collisionless. And right, then okay. um, around so the uh, around that time the simulation I showed you was didn't include gas, but the um, but soon oh, after that okay. they did. They include both gas and the n body. Right. So the gas is hydro um, hydrodynamical and then the um, and the n body and they're they're right done they're, together. Oh I see. Okay. Um, so in in um, I, I guess the the thing that's cool that, that I really like about your talk um, is just you're stressing the what presumably keeps you up at night in your work is like what are the possible selection effects that I don't know about that might be uh, that might be sort of plaguing us and we don't yet have a handle on them is it, so I'm kind of curious how much does that sort of linger in the back of your mind all the time? Um, <laughs> what is my low level? <laughs> yeah, yeah, level? Like... yeah. Um, so the, I guess the way that we, um, we deal with this to some extent in a practical way is I have to choose where am I going to invest my very valuable telescope time? Right. So how am I going to design a sample that allows me to answer my science question? And so that choice, I mean, that those are our experiments. How am I choosing my sample? Yeah. How can I, uh, what properties of, of whatever it is I'm going to look at? Um, how, how do I find what I want to look at? And how do I filter it so that I have, and of course you have to say, I can't ask for too much time because they'll definitely say no. And I need to, I need to be able to get good enough data so I can answer my question. And then I also want to make sure that I don't waste this time and I've chosen well. So I would say that's sort of in practice where it where it comes out is just having to be extremely thoughtful about how I'm choosing my sample. And then of course you have to write the science justification um, with all that right. behind. Um, I would say I feel that um, I do feel that there's this sort of, you know, a conventional wisdom that, oh, you need a merger to form a quasar. And so the fact that I'm like, well, do you really? Uh, it kind of makes me feel better, right? If I just agreed with everybody, maybe I'd be more nervous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, that was sort of my next question was sort of, yeah, how do you protect against or how do you safeguard against? selection of text that you don't know about. It sounds like like working yeah. really hard on your Yeah, so and and then also what I mean it's now just become a huge amount of work. Like I think part of it is just recognizing that you really need to invest a lot of work in understanding your selection effects, you know, end to end. Um, all every single time you make a choice about what you're going to follow up you know, what colors, what filters you're going to use for your images, uh, how are you going to decide which are going to follow up? I mean, you have to really think about what the potential impacts of that are. And so I would just say there's, a, there's much, much more energy 
that's being done on that. On a super, this is this is uh, a technical issue, but one of the things that's interesting is now working on space missions, you have to decide, um, there's what's called a technical readiness level. And as you're getting ready to launch something into space, you have to make sure all of the different pieces of your technology are advanced enough so that you can count on them actually working in space. And in parallel to that, there's something that's called a science readiness level. And so, and a lot of simulations are required to demonstrate that, okay, with this system, we think we can answer our science question. And so that activity really happens in parallel. And now it's been sort of codified in order to, I'm working on a project right now and we have to advance the science to science ready, readiness level four. And that means we have demonstrated with simulations that we can do the science we want to do. Cool. So it's okay. really codified in that way. Right, okay. Yeah, this is really fascinating that just like learning more and more about the use of simulation and how it's really deeply entrenched in a lot more aspects of kind of work that you're doing. Than, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's really <laughs> a major purpose. Right, cool, thanks. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Gallagher.